Good evening. Thank you for joining us for this parent community information session. My name is Dan Bowles. I'm the superintendent of schools for the North Syracuse Central School District. I'd like to introduce you to all the people that I have here that will help us during this evening's information center. Dr. Christopher Leahy. He is the associate superintendent for teaching and learning. Don Keegan is the assistant superintendent for business, maintenance and operations, transportation and food service. Jason Nephew, who is the assistant superintendent for human resources. Valerie DeFlorio, executive director for pupil personnel services and she oversees special education. Greg Stone, he is the director of elementary education and ELA and math. Lisa Goldberg is our director of social emotional learning. And Jamie Sullivan is our acting executive principal at CNS High School. And again, I wanna welcome the parents this evening for joining us for this information session for those of us that have just signed on. Our goal tonight is to answer questions that people have regarding the reopening of schools. This is the first of three information sessions that will be conducted over the next week. The next two sessions, if people are unable to see this one, will be on Monday, August 17th from 6 to 7 p.m. and Tuesday, August 18th from 6 to 7 p.m. All of the questions and answers will be recorded and posted to our website so that people can obtain the information if they were unable to tune in tonight. The format will go as follows. We had uh, asked people to submit their questions in advance so that we would have time to make sure we did a thorough job in answering all of those questions for you. I've assembled the people who oversee the particular areas in order to properly respond to the questions that have been asked. We found that there were four major areas that were solicited the questions. The first was health and safety. The second was hybrid and remote instruction. The third, special education. And the fourth main theme was transportation. I do wanna remind parents that we are all partners in this work, especially during these times, and that social distancing and hand washing will be very important and we will be sending out videos and training so that it will help our children learn what to expect when they come into the new environment. One of our first questions is in the health and safety area and we receive many questions regarding screenings of students and staff. I'm going to let Mr. Keegan start off by answering that question. Mr. Keegan. Thank you, Dan. Um, well, let's start with the guidance. New York State guidance states that temperatures must be taken daily and that students and staff must be screened periodically. It also states that any student or staff member with a fever of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or greater and or symptoms of possible COVID-19 virus infection should not be present at school. According to the CDC, the symptoms include fever and chills, cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, fatigue, muscle or body aches, headache, a new loss of taste or smell, um, a sore throat, congestion or runny nose, nausea or vomiting, and or diarrhea. Therefore, based on that guidance, the North Surge Central School District will take all student temperatures upon arrival at school. Staff and parents will be required to complete an online screening questionnaire using our school messenger system that most of our community is very familiar with. The questionnaire will confirm that the staff member, parent or child have not had COVID-19 symptoms in the past 14 days, have not tested positive for COVID-19 in the past 14 days, have not come in close contact with a confirmed or suspected case of COVID-19 in the past 14 days, and have not traveled to any of the states listed on the New York State list of states requiring quarantine. Staff are going to be required to complete this questionnaire daily. Parents will be required to complete this questionnaire on behalf of their children weekly. 
Further, any staff member or student who demonstrates any symptoms of COVID-19 will not be permitted on school property until they have received a negative COVID-19 test and where appropriate, a note from their doctor explaining that any ongoing symptoms are related to another health condition such as seasonal allergies or asthma. If a child or staff member arrive at school and demonstrate symptoms of COVID-19, they will be isolated, evaluated by our school nurse, and where appropriate, instructed to see their physician or visit an urgent care to be tested for COVID-19. Again, they will only be allowed back in school upon receipt of a negative COVID-19 test result and where appropriate, a note from their doctor explaining the ongoing symptoms and relate that, uh, that, are, that they're related to another health condition. I hope this clarifies the screening process. Thank you, Mr. Keegan. And one question that we also have been asked, will my student or staff member be required to get a COVID test to return to school in September. Any COVID test that's happening uh, at the start of school would be on a voluntary basis. Uh, the school cannot mandate a COVID test just to start school. The only time the school would make a recommendation to get a COVID test will be if someone shows signs or symptoms or the parameters that Mr. Keegan outlined. The next question, another series of questions were asked, how we will deal with COVID-19 testing and confirmed cases within our school community? Mr. Keegan, again, can you answer that question? Sure, sure. Um, so as, as uh, Mr. Bowles mentioned, uh, the uh, New York State Education Department and Onondaga County uh, Department of Health guidance clearly states that schools must comply with the CDC and not conduct COVID-19 testing or require testing of any kind of testing, antibodies or otherwise. Um, however, we are gonna work with Onondaga County to provide an opportunity for students and staff to be tested on a volunteer basis at their school. Uh, again, uh, the guidance is very clear that if a person is diagnosed with COVID-19 through a positive test, they should not be in school and they should stay home. Um, the, the guidance on it says that they stay home um, at least 10 days since the indi individual first had symptoms. And it's been at least three days since the individual had a fever without using fees of fever reducing medicine. And it's been at least three days since the individual presented COVID-19 symptoms. Therefore at North Syracuse, based on that guidance, we won't allow a student or staff member to attend school unless they've quarantined for 14 days from the positive test and are symptom free. If they're not symptom free, they will need a note from their doctor explaining that ongoing symptoms are related to another health condition. A confirmed case within our school community will also require that contact tracing be performed by the Onondaga County Health Department. This allows public health officials to put in place isolation or other members or measures, I should say, to limit the spread of the virus. North Syracuse must coordinate and cooperate with state and local health department to facilitate contact tracing. Our role is to assist the health department in knowing who may have uh, had contact at school with a confirmed case. And we do that by keeping accurate attendance, record, attendance records for students and staff, ensuring student schedules are up to date, keeping a log of any visitors, um, and, and assisting the health department in tracing all contacts of individuals at school in accordance with the protocol of the New York State Contact Tracing Program. Rest assured, confident, confidentiality will be maintained as required by federal and state laws, um, and school staff uh, will not try to determine who's excluded from school based on contact tracing without guidance from uh, and direction from the health department. We're gonna work really closely with the Onondaga Health Department on this, um, on this item. As a matter of fact, recently we spoke with Dr. Agupta, the Commissioner of Health for the Onondaga County Health Department. And, and we learned that any person with 10 minutes of direct contact with a confirmed case of COVID-19 should be investigated. Um, at North Syracuse Central School District, we'll notify all students and staff who have had direct contact with a confirmed case of COVID-19. 
These individuals will also be contacted by a contact tracer from the Department of Health. It's, it is likely that at the direction of the County Depart Health Department, they will be tested for COVID-19 and quarantined for 14 days as a result of this contact. The students in the same class as the confirmed case, the teacher and other staff members, as well as the bus driver and other students that ride the bus with this student will be included in this group. Again, it's only direct contact of 10 minutes or more with a confirmed case. So if your child's in another class with a student who's had contact with a confirmed case, but has not been confirmed to have COVID-19, it's unlikely that your child will be quarantined. Again, schools um, will work very closely. Uh, the district and individual schools will work very closely with the Onondaga County Health Department to get their guidance and their direction on the contact tracing program. Uh, related to this, people asked if schools were gonna be closed um, if we had a case of COVID-19. And you might remember that early on, uh, we said we closed school for 24 hours, um, but the guidance has changed. And, and, uh, and what we're being told now is that um, we will not close school if there's one confirmed case. We will follow the, the County Health Department's guidance, do the contact tracing, make sure we isolate those folks that have been um, in direct contact, um, and any school closure decision will be made based on infection and attendance rates and only after consulting with the County Health Department. Thank you, Mr. Keegan. The next question is about instruction and the hybrid model. The question states, I signed up my child to come in on the hybrid plan because it's what's best for my child, but I have res many reservations given the unique situation of my son. I want to know how the hybrid is being handled or at rising cases in the county, will we be able to switch to remote without having to wait the full trimester? And Mr. Leahy, if you could answer that question. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. That's when I fielded from several parents over the last few days. Um, there's still a little bit of anxiety about sending children to school. And I think parents are concerned they don't wanna be locked into um, a decision that they're making in August for several months. Um, what we're asking of parents is if you're asking to, to go to the hybrid model, we're asking um, students to stay, whether it's hybrid or remote for the first trimester for kindergarten through fourth grade. And that would be up till December 4th. And we're asking for the, set, the first semester for grades five through 12, which would get us to late January. Um, we ask that only so we can create stable classes, we can manage assignments, we can make sure that we have everything that we need in place for students to come to school and be successful and deliver instruction. Um, and those are very important critical items that we spend much of the summer um, investigating and, and, and ensuring before school begins. Um, the challenge we have is, of course, situations change. We are, we are very sympathetic. We understand that some parents and families have unique circumstances that, that take place throughout the year. Um, we've talked to several parents throughout the week, and if, a, if, if there's a hardship or a family, there's a, a change in a family situation or a dynamic or someone that has a health condition, um, we certainly will work with families on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but we're asking families to support us and support our program by, by keeping it as, as static as possible, not moving too many people too soon. And, and of course, if there are unique situations, we'll, we'll support families, work with our building principals to make sure our students are in the right place. Thank you. The next question I have says, will there be a set schedule for remote learning such as a normal school day would have? Or is it going to be self-paced? Will there be interaction? Will students be provided with textbooks or will it be strictly online based? Again, Dr. Leahy? Yeah, that's, a, that's another question that, that I fielded quite a few times. Um, and I'm gonna give my best response. Um, as we work through this, um, we're exploring the best ways to provide instruction for students. And it may be varied based on grade level, subject area and prioritization of curriculum standards. We're anticipating that given teachers will have full schedules four days a week with students in class, there's gonna be a combination of online virtual lessons and materials posted with feedback provided on Google Classroom on days students are not in school. So we're trying to build a structure both for when students are in school as well as when students are not in school. Um, and we, want, we know that families want a predictable structure, a schedule for their students. We're gonna be releasing a, a few more details tomorrow as our committee finishes up their work. 
Um, the other part of that too, is we have to make sure that we provide every student and every, a certified teacher for every class. In kindergarten through sixth grades, what we're exploring at this point is having a designated teacher work with each grade level for those remote learners. Um, in seven through 12, it becomes a little bit more challenging because certification is based by discipline. And then at that point, we may be doing what we're gonna be most likely be doing is assigning students to classes um, with certified teachers. And if we have a, a certain set number of students to create a new section, that could be a virtual section. We're still waiting to see how those numbers shake out and what we're gonna see for registration for complete remote. But we understand that um, regardless, there's gonna be some synchronous instruction where teachers are, are working you know, live with students, asking questions, giving feedback, providing instruction. There will be asynchronous instruction too, where there will be materials posted, um, resources, videos, um, assignments, and then feedback given throughout um, the learning plan. Um, those are, both of those things are gonna happen. We'll be providing a few more details tomorrow after our committee wraps up. We wanna get something out to parents um, in terms of a, a set schedules at the end of the day tomorrow. Um, but we, we, this is a question that is, is very important to parents and, and we're gonna have some more details tomorrow. But at this point, you know, what I can answer is, is that we are gonna have some blending of synchronous and asynchronous. It'll look different by grade level um, and we'll have some more details to share tomorrow. Thank you, Dr. Leahy. The next question that I have, uh, it says, what will the hybrid instruction look like for CNS? With it being one day a week, Will we be going back to eight periods so students get every class each week? And if uh, uh, Jamie Sullivan could answer that question. Sure. We explored the idea of bringing students in um, for eight periods a day. It unfortunately isn't going to work out. So we decided that we are going to bring students in the, the first week that they're in, they're going to be in their first floor, four blocks. They're going to see their teachers for 79 minutes. The following week that they come in, they're going to see their next four blocks of teachers uh, for 79 minutes of, of class time. Um, students will follow the traditional uh, A, B, C, D day rotation like we've done always in the past. Students will get that calendar on the first day of school. They will also have it, we will also have it posted on the district webpage and we will also blast it out. So students will always know when they come into school, which letter day we're on and which teachers they'll, they'll need to see that day. So they're prepared. Thank you, Jamie. Will that schedule be the same at the junior high? Yep, uh, the junior high and the high school, we're all on the same page. Um, we felt that was probably gonna be the best for parents um, given, given everything that's going on right now. Thank you very much. The next question I have says, what will a typical day look like for our elementary students in the hybrid model? Mr. Stone? Thanks, Mr. Bowles. So uh, first I wanna say, as we worked on those elementary schedules, the number one priority for us was always safety. And um, there were a lot of safety measures that are put in place across the district. And that's where we started building from. Um, so as most of the community knows, if you haven't seen it already, uh, for the elementary, for that K-4, Middle school is very similar, but right now I'm talking just K-4. Um, they're, they're divided into two cohorts. So we've got, our, uh, we've got one group of students, which is last name of A through K, that would be cohort A, and cohort B would be uh, last name of letters L through Z. And so what that day is gonna look like um, starts with the, the arrival time. So our first cohort, the last names of A through K would arrive um, at our typical time around nine o'clock in our elementary schools. And we've built in an ample amount of time for us to maintain social distancing as students are coming in and out of the building um, while those temperature checks are all happening and while they're making their way down to the classrooms. We're also building in hand washing time uh, so that we're making that part of that routine on a regular basis, uh, both for in school and hopefully to carry on beyond school. Um, that's an important part. The next piece we talk about and in, in what we're really spending time around is how do we build that social emotional component for our for our youngest students, especially in the elementary school. So there is going to be a big focus on those first several weeks of school on community building, on uh, relationship building between students and of course the teacher and building that school community. This is an opportunity for us to really connect with students, get to know them as best as possible because we don't know what's gonna be happening in the future. We may be going back and forth between models. Um, as far as the instructional day goes, uh, when the students are in school, so that cohort A of students, the last name of A through K, I'll use them as our example. They would be there on Monday and Tuesday. 
and they would, they would uh, participate in a regular school day, very similar to what our typical elementary day would look like in a normal face-to-face -face setting. They would be getting their ELA instruction, um, a full, full block of ELA instruction. Um, of course, they're gonna be getting the, their lunch. Lunch will be in the classroom um, and we will uh, we'll be bringing the lunches down to the students in the classroom. The classrooms themselves are gonna be set up in a way that we can maintain social distancing as many people have probably seen on the news where we have desks spaced out six feet apart. Um, we're also trying to make it as, um, as elementary oriented as possible with of course bright colors and very welcoming environment um, to the extent possible. That's an important part. We need to remember these are, these are our younger students. So beyond that ELA and lunch, of course they're gonna be getting their full block of math instruction. Uh, they will be getting a content block of science or social studies. Uh, they will be getting a special every single day. So there'd be music, art, library, or physical education. Um, most likely that was going to be happening in the classroom where the teacher comes to uh, the students. We're still looking at uh, physical education, what we can do with that. Um, we are building in, of course, recess and multiple breaks throughout the day, uh, multiple stretch breaks. Um, and like I said, a recess time. Um, and I'd also like to point out, we're going to use as much as possible to get outside during this nice weather. We can teach from outside maintaining that social distancing. We can do uh, physical education from outside. So we're gonna to try to capitalize on that while we've got some nice weather here. Um, and we've also built in a, a flex time that we haven't been able to have in the elementaries that's gonna allow teachers to really meet the indiv individual needs of students on a case-by-case -case basis. So that's what that instruction is gonna look like on a Monday and a Tuesday. Um, now for our cohort B, those other students who weren't at school and face-to-face -face learning, they're gonna be receiving what we call asynchronous instruction. And um, what that really consists of typically is we're gonna be uh, posting work or videos or instructional videos, um, differing types of activities that are interactive, not busy work, work that is actually aligned to what was taught in the classroom and supporting what was already taught. So we're gonna be very mindful of creating assignments that are meaningful for students. And as Dr. Leahy mentioned, that feedback is gonna be a key component to our instruction um, in that remote setting. So that's what's gonna happen for those students who weren't in session Monday and Tuesday. On Thursday and Friday, it completely flips and our cohort B comes in and does the same schedule while cohort A is getting that asynchronous instruction. Um, the last part I'll just talk about is that Wednesday day where we do not have students in school. And I know I've been getting a lot of questions uh, from parents is what's gonna happen on Wednesday? And um, what's important and what we've built into the schedule is time for our teachers to actually collaborate and plan and really get this under their belt because they've got a lot on their plates trying to manage those two different work environments uh, but at the same time, we're building in a quality instructional day on Wednesday. So all of our students, if you're a first grader, um, you would join up to Mrs. Smith's class and you would receive synchronous instruction, meaning virtual real-time face-to-face instruction uh, with the teacher. And you will also be getting asynchronous work uh, to be completed independently on that day. So that's gonna be a day where we can kind of bring all the students together in a virtual setting, provide instruction, but also provide that supporting um, content and, and uh, and work for students following up that, with what was taught. Um, and then at the end of the day, of course, we'll have ample time for dismissal in a safe manner and get the kids on the bus and home in a safe manner. Thank you, Mr. Stone. The next question that I have is, what will kindergarten look like for my child? When they attend school, what will be the safety precautions? Again, Mr. Stone? Sure, thanks. So I talked a little bit about safety, um, but I wanna mention that our elementary principals and our teachers have uh, been working really hard to develop a plan for our newest students, our kin incoming kindergartners. These are children who have never been in school. And so we really need to think about how we can do this mindfully, um, keeping in mind the safety guidance, but also the, the, um, the, young, uh, the young minds and the young learners that are coming in. So we're currently working on a plan for a kindergarten orientation uh, where families are gonna be able to visit our school in a safe manner in small groups. They'll get an opportunity to meet teachers uh, the students are going to be able to see the building and the inside of classrooms um, and even get a chance to, uh, to be on a school bus, again, when we're taking some really safe measures to keep everyone safe. Um, it's going to look very different from past orientations. Uh, we will invite parents and students um, at set times, so they'll be coming in smaller groups where our building principals will review um, all of the typical orientation information. We plan to hold, um, we, we plan to hold this at our school buildings to the extent possible and Bear Road, we're including with that too. Uh, Bear Road might, since they're doing a renovation, uh, we might have that held in another building, but we're working on a plan so Bear Road gets an equal uh, opportunity at that orientation. 
and we're gonna hold, pretty much everything's gonna be outside of the building. We're gonna hold orientation on a nice day and, and pray that we got nice uh, sunny weather to, to be able to have that outside. Um, students, like I said, are gonna have an opportunity to visit classrooms, to see what schools look like and feel like. Uh, we'll have those safety measures. Um, is, I already talked about the curriculum component, so I think I mentioned that earlier. Um, and I think it just comes back to safety as our number one priority. Um, the administrators and teachers and the staff, they're really working hard uh, to build strong educational programs around our safety measures. Uh, we're also focusing on that social emotional that I mentioned of all of our learners and particularly our youngest ones. And teachers are gonna spend a good portion of that opening several weeks with our students, really building that community and those relationships. Um, so we're keeping that in mind for certainly our youngest students as well. Thank you, Mr. Stone. The next area that I'd like to address is special education. And we had several questions in that area. So how are the services going to be delivered in our special education program? Mr. Florio? Okay, so consistent with previous guidance, school districts must ensure that students with disabilities um, receive their special education programs and the related services to the greatest extent possible to what is on the IEP. However, with 2021 school year coming up, we have health and safety that has put some specific guidelines in place that we need to follow. So what that's gonna look like is gonna be completely different. So what we need to do is we need to ensure that the services are still gonna be provided, but again, it's gonna to be to the greatest extent possible. So the manner in which they were once provided is gonna look a little bit different. So the mode and how they're gonna be, the manner, the mode in which it's gonna be presented, is it gonna be due to teletherapy? If we can't maintain social distancing, um, how that's gonna look. So is it gonna be face-to-face? -face? Is it gonna be push and pull out? Is all gonna be dependent upon how we're able to uh, adhere to the social distancing guidelines and the amount of um, space in classrooms for us to be able to do that. Um, again, it is to the greatest extent possible, but the related services and the special ed programs are gonna be provided to the students with IEPs. Thank you. My next special ed question is, are my kids going to be removed from ELA and math? And are they able to participate with the general education students? Okay, so um, again, what the goal for us is to do is to, and I'm gonna use this word a lot, so to the greatest extent possible, provide the special education programs to the students with the disabilities um, and the related services. Uh, what we are looking to do is maximize all the opportunities that we can for instruction for students with disabilities to participate with students without disabilities. Um, again, to the greatest extent possible with um, according to their IEP, to be consistent with their IEP. It is difficult um, during this time with COVID and with all the things that are being put in place. So we're doing the best that we can to ensure that we have, we are adhering to the least restrictive um, environment when it comes to students and their IEPs. Okay. The next question again is for special ed, what is the criteria for students to go five days a week? Okay, so that's a really good question. And actually we've, there's a lot of discussion about that. So um, the guidance has really prioritized high needs students. Um, and that has been something that uh, the districts around our county, we've had a lot of discussion on that. So when we're looking at students with high needs, what we are looking at are students that um, are in special class settings, 12-1-4, 15 to one, whose instructional programming is best accomplished in a self-contained setting. So we are talking students who predominantly spend less than, well, to give a figure, 40% or more of their day, less than that is in the general education setting. Okay, thank you very much. The next question I have is, will there be counseling available for my child if need be, given the hybrid schedule. Uh, Ms. Goldberg, Mrs. Goldberg. Thanks for that question, Mr. Bowles. That's a great question. All of our services are going to continue as they have before. And we're really fortunate because in this last budget cycle, we were able to hire an additional social worker and an additional half-time social worker. 
so that all of our elementary schools will have one consistent mental health provider every day in the building. In addition, that would be either a school social worker or a school counselor, in addition to a school psychologist. Also, we have ADAPEP counselors who do social and emotional learning lessons with our students. All of these services will continue. Thank you. Next question, if my child is anxious about returning to school, is there someone there that he can be referred to for support? And that's Mrs. Goldberg. We are really fortunate in that we have so many wonderful providers in our system. Additionally, our staff will be receiving lots of support and instruction around how to create, when, when Mr. Stone talks about safe environments, it's not only physical safety, it's emotional safety. And that is our highest priority. And so our staff will be prepared. Additionally, there are resources on our website. Last uh, spring when we went remote learning, we created a wellness page on our website. It's, if you go to our district website and go to the additional pages, it's there, it will be moving forward. But there is a page of parent resources that uh, gives you some guidance about how to start these conversations with your students, how to address their anxiety, their stress, and how to keep yourself resilient and resourceful. Thank you. We've received a variety of questions regarding facilities and cleaning. The CDC provides specific guidance for school-wide cleaning. We have broken the facilities into different areas and I will outline the guidance for each of us as we walk through them. Can Mr. Keegan answer some of those questions? Sure, sure. Um, so we're gonna cover um, a, a number of different areas. Let's start with ventilation. The guidance says that school districts should increase ventilation with outdoor air to the greatest extent possible. And that includes things like opening windows and doors while maintaining health and safety protocols particularly for younger students. So all North Syracuse Central School District buildings have robust ventilation systems designed to deliver fresh air to occupied spaces. The district's in the process of upgrading all of our filters to the recommended what's called MERV 13 uh, standard, which will improve the uh, indoor air quality. It'll just filter the air that much more. Um, in those facilities without air conditioning, Fans will be allowed, but fans will be placed in a manner to draw uh, clean outdoor air. Um, so that's that's uh, kind of the ventilation piece. Let's talk a little bit about um, some of the spaces and how they're how they're going to be configured. The guidance strongly encourages the district to modify or reconfigure spaces and areas, um, and or to restrict the use of classrooms and other spaces where students faculty and staff gather so that individuals can be socially distant. That's our priority to keep people safe. Um, and we don't want people sharing workstations or desks or tables or, or other shared services without cleaning and disinfecting between uses. So um, if we're using the cohort model, which we are, uh, cleaning and disinfection uh, may be performed between each group's use instead of individual's use. So that's, that's the guidance. Um, and uh, North Syracuse classrooms will be re reorganized to promote social distancing. The number of students occupying a classroom at one time will vary depending on the schedule and the size of the room. Generally, class sizes will range from seven to 14 students. Our goal is to ensure that students and staff have the ability to remain six feet apart at all times. Um, students will be able to use lockers depending on their needs as determined by building administration However, no shared lockers uh, will be permitted. Let's talk a little bit about um, hygiene, cleaning and disinfection, which is kind of uh, you know, a, a, a really important point as we, as we look at uh, maintaining safe environments. Um, the guidance says the districts must adhere to and promote hygiene, cleaning and disinfection um, as set forth by the Department of Health and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The district must train all students faculty and staff on proper hand and respiratory hygiene. Um, the district must maintain logs that include date, time, and scope of cleaning and disinfection, as well as identify cleaning and disinfection frequency for each facility and each type and, um, and assign responsibility to staff. 
including strategies for cleaning and disinfecting um, exposed areas um, and appropriate notification of occupants of such areas. So as a result of that guidance, the North Syracuse Central School District will continue to use the same cleaning for health protocols that have been in place for several years with a few minor changes to our chemical choices given the need to serve food in many of the classrooms. Our regular classroom disinfectant is being replaced with a, what's called a food safe product, similar to the ones we use in our kitchens. In addition, we've added another level of disinfection by purchasing and deploying what's called Clorox electrostatic sprayers, which apply a disinfectant more effectively and efficiency, efficiently. Um, and these systems will be used in high exposure areas. Um, please know that cleaning and disinfection will not um, take place in spaces while they're occupied by students, nor will it take place when staff is present unless the staff member is involved in the cleaning process. Comprehensive cleaning and disinfecting of spaces and equipment will occur, uh, will occur every night. Um, during the school day though, North Syracuse Central School District staff will work together to serve, service spaces between groups and members of the MO team will periodically service restrooms, common areas, and high touch points throughout the facilities. All spaces will contain a log indicating the time of service and the activities completed. So it'll be very obvious to anybody involved what's gone on in that room and whether it's been uh, disinfected. Um, our routine periodic inspection of spaces will now include the use of an ATP monitor. Um, that's a, a special monitor that measures the effectiveness of the disinfection process. And our head of uh, our head custodian um, and uh, um, supervisor of all the custodians is gonna go around and use this device uh, to, to monitor cleanliness of rooms. Staff assignments are in progress and strategies are in place to supplement staff as needed. As you can imagine, we've right now got a first shift, second shift, third shift staff, and we're gonna have to move some of those folks so that we can have more people available to do cleaning during the day, those, those wipe downs midday, uh, so that we can support the instructional process. Students and staff will have access to hand sanitizer where soap and water is not available. They will not be given their own bottle of hand sanitizer, but district hand sanitizer will be replenished throughout the district um, as necessary by the custodial staff. There are a few other items I wanna mention that, uh, that are important, I think, to the, the health and safety of the environments that our students and staff are gonna be working in. As a general rule, drinking fountains will be turned off, but students and students and staff will be encouraged to bring in personal water bottles for their exclusive use. Water can be drawn from force faucets or bottle fillers were available. The district's made a significant investment in bottle fillers around the district and in hopes that, uh, that students will take advantage of those. Um, adequate um, access um, uh, and, and in line with the code requirements and building occupancy will be maintained and monitored at all times. Um, so we're, we want to make sure people have drinking water, particularly during those uh, early uh, school months where it might be a little bit hotter. Uh, another, another key area is that the number of toilet and sink fixtures available will meet or exceed standards of the New York State Building Code. Now keep in mind, our buildings are gonna be occupied, occupied at significantly below capacity. So we are gonna block off some toilets or, or, or stalls as appropriate to facilitate social distancing when, uh, you know, when possible. And, and, and uh, let me put it this way, we will make sure that we have social distancing, but we will always be in compliance with New York State uh, building codes. Um, those are the major points, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Keenan. Thank you, Mr. Keenan. My next question, how will band orchestra for the hybrid model of learning be handled? Are they allowed to play instruments in group settings on the day they're in school? Or will they pull up, be pulled out for lessons? Dr. Leahy? Yeah, that's a great question. And I know we want to, we value our arts programs and we want to continue those as much as possible. It's certainly challenging in this environment when we assume we can bring a hundred kids together um, we can bring 10 kids together in a small group, deliver you know, lessons. That has all changed. At the same time, we are absolutely committed to, to moving forward in this environment the best we can to the best of our ability. So at this point, our, our working plan going into the school year is that our elementary students will not be pulled out of classes the two days they're there for lessons. Lessons will be um, delivered online. We still are going to maintain our staffing, our music staffing. We're going to maintain um, lessons, but they are going to be online on those days that they're not in school. 
Um, and we just think that would be one less transition for kids to, to make. It, it wouldn't be pulling them away from their core academic time. At the same time, we do feel it's a priority. We do think we can do a good job of, of delivering those lessons online for students K through four. When we get to the middle schools, we're gonna be doing probably mostly online there as well. And then when we get to our larger schools, we're going to be doing, um, we'll actually be doing some lessons in person, given that we've got some additional spaces and some more flexibility in the schedules. In those areas, we are looking at doing lessons in person, um, following social distancing guidelines in grades seven through 12. We may be looking at, at five and six in some creative ways. Um, but what I want to tell all of our parents of, of our students who are involved with music is we are committed to those programs. We want to continue those lessons. Um, we'll be doing them online in the younger grades of, at first and, and as many in person as possible, 7 through 12. Um, and then hopefully the social distancing guidelines will be relaxed and we'll be able to, uh, to get everybody in the same room together at some point in the near future. Thank you. Next question is, will there be consistency in the instruction K through 12? Mr. Stone? Sorry about that, I had to unmute. So, um, so yes, it, it, we, we heard loud and clear and we knew this going in. It was a huge challenge and a huge lift at the very beginning when we initially transitioned into this, um, this uncharted territory back in March. Um, that, was, that was a complete flip to our entire educational model and of course, uh, unanticipated. So there was a big scramble there and we've learned a lot from, um, from where we were to where we're gonna be this fall. So, um, so at the heart of much of the summer planning has been around the word consistency. And we're building multiple different measures in order to, to get to that much more consistent approach. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So um, all of our core content areas um, have been or will be spending um, some significant time prioritizing their curriculum and their essential standards, um, as well as the essential learning outcomes this fall. Um, of what those expectations will be. And so what I mean by that is uh, we know students are going to be coming in with some learning gaps. Um, that's unavoidable at this point. We're going to assess them to try to figure out where those are. And, um, but then we have to think about where do we need them to be by the end of the school year? How do we start closing that gap? And how are we going to do that in a model where um, we're not going to be seeing students face to face as much as possible? So we do that by prioritizing our curriculum. Everything we teach, of course, is very important. But when we actually go through a process of prioritizing, we, there's, there's, a, there's a process you go through to figure out what is the most important, um, which standards are the ones that are going to carry over to the next course or the next school year, um, which are the ones ultimately in life that, that students are going to need. And so although we want to teach everything to the fullest, we will be having to pare down some things to those priority, uh, those priority areas. And that would be for any content, whether you teach ELA math, uh, if you teach a music course, you know, whatever you're teaching, we have to be thinking a little bit differently. So um, there is going to be time provided for that, and a lot of that time will come from that Wednesday time I mentioned, where teachers will have additional uh, planning time in their schedule, as well as some work we're going to do at the district level to assist with that. Um, so we've also been, like I said, planning for that learning loss, anticipating how is our curriculum going to adapt for that, how are we going to meet students where they are um, at any level, and then get them to where do they need to be. So prioritizing curriculum is a part of that. The other part is how are we going to differentiate our instruction to, uh, to meet the varying needs of where students are. And a lot of that comes down to assessments. And so the other piece to this is we've, we've been spending time on what common assessments look like, uh, meaning that we, we all at a grade level or all at a department or a content area um, give a similar common assessment so that we can sit down and kind of co-plan from there. And so that's where that team planning time is gonna be coming in. Um, so coming back to differentiated instruction, prioritizing our curriculum, uh, coming up with differentiated ways of meeting those needs, but doing that in a team setting. And this is where those teams are going to be huge. Um, we, this is unanticipated knowing how to approach this for the fall. So there's a lot of thought going in. Building leaders are a part of that. Um, and the collaboration piece is going to be probably the most important part of our system to address all those different learning gaps and come up with new and creative ways of, of meeting the needs of each student. Thank you. Several parents have asked about how does breakfast and lunch will work in this hybrid model? Mr. Keegan? Sure, well, the, the, uh, again, uh, anchoring our, our decision, our process and the guidance, uh, the guidance document uh, that New York State produced states that schools must provide all students with access to school meals each school day. This includes students in attendance at school and students learning remotely. So districts must comply with all applicable health and safety guidelines. They must um, 
Districts must include measures to protect students with food allergies if providing meals and spaces outside the cafeteria. And districts must include protocols and procedures for how students will perform hand hygiene before and after eating and how the sharing of food and beverages will be discouraged. Uh, districts must also include protocols and procedures that require cleaning and disinfection prior to the next group of students arriving for meals. And the districts must ensure compliance with the child nutrition program requirements. And therefore, based on that guidance, um, the uh, North Syracuse Central School District will provide the following meal service. So food service operations uh, will provide meals in accordance with the National School Lunch Program. Free meals will be given to students eligible for free and reduced meals and charged to the students who are not eligible, just like it works in, in a normal non-COVID uh, environment. Although we'll accept cash, parents are gonna be encouraged to fund their child's My School Bucks account in advance of school opening to reduce the handling of cash and change. Um, the district has waived any administrative fees associated with My School Bucks during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we wanna encourage parents uh, uh, to, uh, that are not free, uh, free and reduced uh, eligible to go ahead and fund those school bucks accounts so that uh, we can avoid that, ex that exchange of cash and change. But, What's gonna happen is that students will be, um, will uh, also just before I even talk about uh, our, our actual service, students will be allowed and you know, encouraged if they want to bring both breakfast and lunch to school. However, at the elementary level, due to feeding in the classroom, we're requesting that no food be brought to school that contains peanut butter or any peanut based products. Um, we will make sure that special meals are available for students with documented allergies. Um, so upon, let's go right to the beginning of the school day. Upon arrival, um, students will be given the opportunity uh, to, uh, this is after their temperature check, to take a grab and go breakfast back to their classroom. At the elementary school, lunches will be served in the classroom, as Mr. Stone uh, mentioned earlier. At the middle school, North Syracuse Junior High and CNS High School, lunches may be served in the cafeteria in, in a manner that allows for social distancing. We want to want to give the kids a chance to, to get up and, and, and move around and, and, uh, and but also keep them in their cohorts and keep them um, uh, socially distant. But uh, we want to leverage that cafeteria if we can and we're working on plans to do that again for not K-4 but for uh, middle, junior high and high school. For again, students with allergies, you know, a doctor's note as always needs to be provided to the nurse in order to receive alternate meal choices. Um, and this is consistent with past practices, but we wanna make sure we're addressing students that have those allergies and providing them with nourishing meals, uh, but those that address uh, their special needs. Um, sharing of food and beverages will be discouraged. All students must wash their hands before and after meals. Um, all food service staff um, will be screened daily um, and required to wear masks, aprons, and gloves during uh, meal service to, to avoid any um, any contamination. Grab and go meals will be available for students who are not attending uh, in-person instruction. So if you're, if, you're, if you're on one of your remote days, we're gonna have meals available for you. Um, if, you if you're uh, gonna be not attending any, if you've opted out and you're gonna be uh, um, not attending in-person instruction at all, we're gonna have meals available. Uh, the district will publish um, the sites and times when meals will be available within the next few weeks. And again, Free meals will be given to students who are eligible for free and reduced meals and charged to students who are not, not eligible. I hope that clarifies, Dan, the, the meal service. Thank you, Mr. Keegan. <laughs> One of the questions oh, that's been quite common is, will my child be given a break from wearing their mask? Number one, North Syracuse is requiring all students to wear their mask at all times, even when seated for instruction. However, the guidance document from the State Ed Department does say that mask breaks can be given to students. What that means is while sitting at their desk, six feet apart, social distancing, the teacher can instruct the students to take a, math, a mask break. What that doesn't mean is at that time, it doesn't mean students can then leave their desk and wander around the room. The purpose is to continue to maintain social distancing but allow for students to have the opportunity to have a break from having the mask on for that time. 
then the teacher will tell them when the mask break is over and they will put their mask back on and then move forward from there and continue instruction. The next question that I have is about transportation. We've had a series of questions about what's that going to look like uh, for my child? And again, Mr. Keegan, I believe uh, you can answer that question for us. Sure, sure. Uh, again, uh, uh, based on the guidance, which is very clear that students must wear masks during transport. Um, all buses, which are used every day, must be cleaned and disinfected once a day. High contact spots must be wiped down after each run. And school buses um, cannot be equipped with hand sanitizer um, due to the combustible composition and potential liability to the district. It's just, it's against DOT regulation. So we can't have hand sanitizer um, on the buses. Um, wheelchairs in our special needs buses will be placed uh, to ensure social distancing of six feet. School districts are expected to fulfill existing mandates regarding the safe and effective transportation of students who are homeless. That's the Kenny Vento Act. Uh, in foster care, have disabilities, and attend non-public schools and charter schools. So therefore, North Syracuse Central School District is gonna require students and staff to wear masks during transportation. Students who attempt to board the bus without a mask will be given one by the bus driver. Our bus drivers will have ample supply of extra masks. Uh, we will only allow one child per seat. However, we will encourage children in the same household to sit together. Uh, due to the limited bus capacity necessary to support that social distancing, we're not gonna be able to issue bus passes. Um, as many parents know, uh, it was common practice that if a child wanted to go to another location with parental approval, a bus pass would be issued. But uh, we, can't, uh, we can't allow that uh, because we need to keep the attendance on the buses at a level that, that uh, secures uh, that, uh, that social distancing. When temperatures are above 45 degrees, school bus roof hatches and windows will be open slightly to provide um, consistent airflow, fresh air. A, a very important point, all parents and guardians will be required to ensure that their children are not experiencing any symptoms of COVID-19 and do not have a fever of 100 degrees or more prior to boarding the bus. That's very important. We all have to be uh, aware of our own and our children's uh, health uh, at all times as we, as we reopen schools. All bus drivers will be screened daily and required to wear a mask. Bus attendants will wear a mask, a shield, and gloves while working in close contact with students. Transportation staff will be encouraged to wash their hands with soap and water before and after each run. Uh, when buses arrive at school, they'll be unloaded in a manner that will maintain social distancing and facilitate immediate screening of students. Uh, we will still conduct our mandated uh, safety drills as required by New York State law. So we're going to be on top of the, the, the basics of, of bus safety and transportation safety, um, as we always are. Uh, we're very proud of our, of our record of safety here at North Syracuse. Um, the bus letters, the all-important bus letters that let uh, parents know what their bus stop location will be and their pickup time will be mailed out the last week of August. You'll have them in plenty of time. Uh, to know uh, what the, your, your child's bus um, stop and time will be. Uh, I wanna just emphasize all bus will be cl cleaned and disinfected daily and frequently touched areas are gonna be wiped down after each, each run. Our drivers will be equipped with uh, the necessary uh, materials so they can make sure that that bus is clean for your children. Um, transportation will be provided to all students in accordance with the requirements of their scheduled program. What I mean by that is if your child's in the hybrid program, we're gonna make sure that we're picking your child up and getting them to school on time. If you're a special ed student, uh, or have a, child, a parent of a special ed student and your child's attending five days a week, we're gonna make sure you have the transportation you need. If you're going to a BOCES program, you'll have the transportation you need. UPK, uh, private or parochial school, we're gonna make sure we support uh, those programs with the, uh, with the required transportation. So rest assured, that we'll be able to get your child uh, to school. Um, some parents will still choose to transport their children to school, and we, we understand that, um, and we will support this practice. Um, if you do plan on transporting your child and will not be using uh, school-provided transportation, please, you know, if you can, please notify the North Syracuse Central School District Transportation Department. Once again, we're going to be running our annual hotline, which will 
start on Monday of this coming week. Um, I'll give you the number now, but it'll be on the website. It's 315-218-2035. Uh, the bus hotline number is 315-218-2035. And we welcome any questions or concerns you have on the hotline. Uh, but please, if you're going to be transporting your child on your own, um, and that's that's your game plan, please let us know that. And, and we'll we'll uh, build our routes accordingly. Um, I think that's it, uh, Mr. Bowles. Thank you. I have a question as a parent. If I'm looking for resources to help my child, um, does the district have resources and where can I find them on either the webpage or who is the contact? Uh, I'll start with Mr. Florio. So, yep, our, our webpage, our confirmation, all that is on our webpage, our phone numbers. Um, you can always email me at vdeflory at nscsd.org. You can call my office, 315-218-2144. Again, 315-218-2144. And when you call, it's going to be the Office for Pupil Personnel. A lot of people are still looking for special education. They'll track us down. But when, when you do call, it'll be the Office of Pupil Personnel. Thank you. And uh, Mrs. Goldberg, same question. So I would refer you to our wellness page on our district website that was constructed um, last spring. And it will be moved to the floor so you will easily access it. When you get there, you'll get to a wellness page. On that page, right at the top will be access to your child's school counselor, out of pep counselor, school psych, uh, social worker. So you can uh, reach them right away. And then you can scroll down. It, we have a division of resources for return to school, how to talk with your child about COVID, and all kinds of social, emotional, mental health related uh, services along with access to 211. So any um, food needs, housing needs that you might have, 211 is an incredible resource. And we have all of those resources right available. Additionally, there are hotlines for, uh, there's a COVID hotline that's been set up by the state. There are domestic uh, abuse hotlines. So we try to make it a one-stop shop for any uh, support you might need. And we try to put a lot of resources that are specifically designed uh, for uh, developmentally appropriate for students, for young children. A lot of these concepts are really challenging for young children. Um, and there is a piece about trauma. Uh, a lot of people are talking about trauma and how we as a, as a country are going through the trauma of this pandemic. So there's some explanation of what that is and some of the symptoms that you might see your child exhibiting under stress. So there are supports for you and your children. Okay, thank you. Will there be any training for staff regarding just recognizing students that are in trauma or have had some uh, issues during this time during the pandemic? And again, Mrs. Goldberg? We, we are really fortunate in that before we went out for the pandemic, we did a lot of work around suicide safety. Every building has been trained in suicide safety, which really gives all of our staff a heads up on signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety. And it's not that teachers are going to solve these problems, but they can put kids in touch when they see these issues with our school counselors. I did also want to mention that we are really fortunate. We're the only district in the county other than Syracuse City to have five in-house school-based mental health clinics. And we have a mental health clinic at our high school, at our junior high, in our middle schools, and one at Rocks Elementary. And these are licensed therapists who can see children. Um, if, you, if you've tried to get your child access to a therapist in the community, you know how challenging it is and how long a wait. And we're really fortunate to be able to provide these, uh, these clinics right on our campus. Okay. Thank you. The, the last question for this evening uh, will be, Will there be enough hand sanitizer available along with soaps uh, for my child to have access to? Mr. Keegan? 
Sure. Uh, we are, um, we have been uh, uh, purchasing hand sanitizers, reevaluating where and uh, these products are available. And we want our community to rest assured that there will be uh, plenty of hand sanitizer um, in all of our facilities. And there'll be uh, plenty of opportunities and facilities for uh, students and staff to be washing their hands frequently throughout the day, along with signage uh, that encourages those practices and training and, um, uh, and support so that people are, are uh, doing the right thing to, to stay safe. Great, thank you. I'd like to thank everyone that's tuned in this evening and to listen to uh, the responses to the questions that you've been submitting. Uh, we've gotten hundreds of questions, so we will continue with our, our question and answer on Monday um, from 6 to 7, and that is August 17th, and we will also do the same August 18th from 6 to 7 p.m. All of the information, we will take the questions, and this will be archived and recorded, so that if you do want to uh, circle back, uh, you can go and find out what was stated this evening. I wanna thank everyone for tuning in and I appreciate everyone on the panel that was answering questions. Have a wonderful evening.